So I would say that the requirements for these type of users, that is application developers and machine learning engineers, is to hide all that complexity that comes for a uh, requirement for performance and usage of uh, specialized hardware. Uh, why this is difficult to achieve? Well, anybody who tried it uh, probably knows it very well. And uh, this is not basically uh, anything new, just to, to list it here clearly outlined. And that is uh, a language uh, in interoper interoperability and programming model. Because uh, usually if you are writing in some language that is running on a virtual machine, and you have to talk to native code. Uh, there is a, a different ways to achieve that. And there are different problems uh, which you are facing in doing it. So uh, typically uh, the main problem when it comes to that is uh, technically everything is possible. Okay, you, you can, you can uh, achieve everything. There are tools available, but uh, when it comes to maintaining some bridge with native code and generating it and making it sustainable in the long run, uh, it is very difficult because uh, many of them are open source projects and they need to be updated with uh, every new release. And it is a problem in general, not just uh, for, for deep learning. Also, uh, when it comes to a programming model, when you're using accelerator, uh, and you're processing in batches and you're using highly uh, parallel uh, computation, uh, it's a bit different than uh, what people are used to code. And uh, in a recent uh, uh, GTC talk uh, by uh, GTC conference by NVIDIA talk, th there was an interesting session which was uh, uh, answered the question why the uh, programming model for the NVIDIA CUDA devices is the way it is. And the simple answer, because it is optimized for performance. Now, if you are using this kind of devices, then what you're looking is uh, uh, performance and uh, that model is optimized for, for performance. Uh, so, so it requires not just uh, using different language, but uh, doing a, it, this kind of in a synchronous manner, which is send the data to the device and then uh, invoke the operation and then wait until the operation is completed, uh, which is uh, uh, not something that, that the typical, uh, typical developers are used to. Uh, also, uh, what we just said is uh, send the data to the device is very closely related to the next item. And that is memory management between the accelerator device and the virtual machine. So typically all these uh, uh, APIs for accelerator devices are like uh, are C, C APIs. Uh, and uh, you, you move a, a chunk of memory uh, from, from the VM's memory, basically from the VM memory to the uh, host memory and then to the device memory. And uh, if you look at the code that, 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 that for example, NVIDIA SCUDA, it requires a lot of this uh, manual memory movement. It is very low level, like a kind of a, a C programming, not something that you would expect from uh, to do in language which runs on a virtual machine. Basically, if you are on a virtual machine, you uh, typically expect uh, that the virtual machine uh, or some part of the development platform performs all that uh, uh, jobs for you and also do a garbage collection and uh, things like that. You know, these are purely technical uh, problems and what uh, we would like to have uh, as a developers, but uh, uh, there are some other really, really uh, long time uh, present uh, issues, which is basically with the tensor layout. So every hardware device uh, has uses some uh, specific layout of data, which is as mentioned uh, 
before our tensors, which are, of course, I assume everybody is familiar with the concept of tensor, which is just a uh, n-dimensional array. But uh, the way the, the values are stored in memory can vary from a device and different frameworks and devices use uses different uh, layouts from the reasons uh, usually to achieve uh, the maximum performance for the specific application or the specific hardware architecture. So the problems comes uh, even uh, from the C era and Fortran era and uh, uh, well-known row major or column major layouts of arrays. And uh, when we can, uh, we have tensors, which can have like a, up to eight dimensional arrays. Uh, we have like a first NCHV or NHVC layout, which basically means that the first dimension is used for storing a batch index, uh, second for the channel uh, or th third dimension, H for the height of the matrix and W for the uh, width of the matrix. So it is not uh, uh, it is not something very complicated, but it it could be painful and uh, it can be the the major source of incompatibilities between uh, different uh, hardware and libraries. Also, uh, the kind of optimization uh, now which. Uh, uh, needs to uh, has to be performed is a very hardware specific. So a type of optimization for one chip is completely different that is for the other chip because of the way it is performing uh, those operations or maybe the tensor layout or the way the entire graph of execution is uh, uh, optimized. So when you have uh, all this in mind, uh, you can uh, assume uh, and it is, I would say, pretty clear that uh, deployment, uh, portability, and maintainability is a big challenge uh, for, uh, for the development of this type of application because of a variety of uh, hardware platforms, of libraries, of uh, uh, development deployment environments, uh, and so on. So... Uh, one example, how to illustrate uh, this problem and how the industry is already uh, well aware of it uh, is to show uh, this, uh, sorry, is to show this uh, XLA project, which is uh, open sourced uh, recently by Google. And it is a machine learning compiler for GPUs and CPUs uh, and machine learning accelerators. So uh, I took a quote from a recent blog post of the uh, OpenXLA project, and uh, it, it clearly outlines that uh, uh, it is uh, that without a common compiler to bridge uh, diverse hardware devices uh, to mul multiple frameworks, uh, it is uh, very uh, it, it is required very significant effort. Uh, for to build machine learning since developers must manually optimize model operations for each hardware target. And uh, that uh, uh, that uh, task is really costly to maintain uh, and promotes a vector lock-in and in general, it slow, slows down progress for machine learning developers. So uh, as you can see on the, the this image there, uh, some of the well-known deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX. And you can see uh, that uh, th there are many different uh, hardware platforms which are, which are uh, being uh, used uh, for, for running these frameworks, uh, like Google TPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and, and so on. Uh, also the Intel CPUs. Also, ARM CPUs, graph core. There are many, many things going on in that space, but there are some um, uh, some typical tasks which should be uh, target independent when running these models, and these includes these algebraic optimizations on the then operations and kernel fusion, which is typical for layer operations, uh, and so on. So uh, this is something that uh, 
is really not directly uh, related to virtual machines, but it's a kind of virtual machine and, and maybe should become part of the virtual machine as this kind of optimizations, which is specialized for the uh, running machine learning uh, workloads. Uh, also, uh, another approach uh, to this problem is uh, using uh, Onyx Runtime. And uh, Onyx Runtime uh, is an environment that installs uh, separately and it, it accelerates uh, machine learning across a wide range of frameworks. So this is just bef between uh, frameworks uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the runtime. And also it includes uh, support for different hardware platforms. The idea of Onyx runtime is to automatically parse uh, through the model and identify uh, optimization opportunities and bottlenecks and provide the best uh, acceleration uh, for the available hardware. So this is uh, this picture here is taken from uh, their website, onyxruntime.ai. And as you can see, uh, a lot of different uh, operating systems, uh, languages, and uh, hardware architectures uh, are supported. Uh, so you, you can try it and uh, uh, for yourself and see uh, the one that you that works for you. And, and as you can see, th there are different kind of optimizations uh, that are performed for inference and for training. So this is something. Uh, that it also needs to be kept in mind. Uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to, from this picture, you can see that there are many uh, architectures, many frameworks, many languages. So it is not uh, easy uh, to, to, to support them all, or maybe it is probably impossible, maybe not even required, but uh, uh, from, from this clearly demonstrates the variety uh, of the execution of environments and some would say also uh, fragmentations. So each of these uh, hardware accelerators probably has uh, some good reason to exist and it has some uh, use cases and application domains, but uh, uh, it would be good to find some uh, common ground for all of them and to put that as a, uh, standard uh, optimization that is available for like a some uh, runtime which is uh, optimized for uh, deep learning. So uh, now we come to the part where we talk about uh, lessons that we uh, learned during building a deep learning library on, on top of uh, JVM uh, and, and some of the uh, the things that we talked about, uh, we, we have experienced. So let's uh, talk just briefly about uh, DeepNets. Uh, you can find more details on its website, deepnets.com. And uh, what's important to say that it is a, a deep learning library written purely in Java. And uh, uh, it, it is uh, like for initially, it was like an experiment to see uh, if it is possible and how it works. And once we figured out that it can uh, perform very well for uh, some smaller data sets and problems, and that there is uh, actually a requirement uh, to solve all these problems that we talked about, uh, deployment and integration with existing applications. Uh, it is being used as a, a reference implementation for the standard Java API for visual recognition. Uh, because um, uh, this variety of frameworks uh, really creates uh, problems for a lot of developers and scaling applications uh, and libraries. Uh, the way it, people are usually used to do uh, in Java world. As I say, if you want one isolated application, then it is okay. You, you can solve it uh, any way uh, you prefer and you, 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 you can. But if you want uh, a solution that can be uh, deployed and used by many users and many use cases, then it is a whole lot different uh, story. So uh, the, one of the goals with DeepNets is to uh, provide a Java flavored 
uh, portable and developer friendly uh, API, uh, which can, uh, by the way, uh, be supported by tools since uh, tools play a very important uh, role in the Java ecosystem and many there are many existing tools out there. So uh, DeepNets, uh, besides the library, comes with a tool, uh, development tool, which is based on Apache NetBeans, and uh, which is like an environment, uh, an IDE for deep learning, which can provide wizards and visual tools, which guide a developer in creating a model and in creating like a final jar for, for deployment into the end application. Now, uh, also to mention that uh, DeepNets is uh, free or with tools for development and education. So if you want to uh, give it a try, go ahead. There is also a community version, which is open source and which is a base for this uh, reference implementation of standard Java API. Uh, one important feature uh, recently uh, re related to DeepNets is that is compatibility with TensorFlow models. So uh, this uh, means that you can train models in TensorFlow and then uh, use DeepNets to import it and deploy it into the uh, pure Java environments. Uh, th this is, was all great, but uh, uh, what we have experienced is that uh, for larger uh, models like uh, VGGNet and for really large data sets like ImageNet, uh, we have experienced uh, performance uh, problems. Is it just too slow? And what we figured out that uh, hotspot compilation uh, and this optimization performed by JVM does not always work as expected. Uh, so uh, specifically, uh, the intrinsics uh, and the, and our, our auto vectorization uh, were not applied, and or in some cases they were making things slower. So, to I assume that many of you uh, are familiar with this concept, but just to explain to those who are maybe not, intrinsics uh, you means that uh, during the runtime, uh, the automatic compiler optimization. Uh, replaces the, the, the methods uh, with the uh, uh, methods which are uh, written in native uh, code operations. So either with the either with CPU or assembly code, which uh, uh, which does uh, what needs to be done. For example, copying arrays, which is with system dot array copy, or one example of that. Uh, also, vector auto vectorization means that if uh, during the runtime um, on the CPU uh, there is a, a vector operations available and there is code which performs a lot of additions in uh, basically adding vectors, then the, it should be automatically applied and uh, replaced. So, so the running uh, code should be replaced with vectorized version of optimizations. And while this uh, was initially working uh, very well, uh, you know, in our experiments, uh, we figured out that uh, when putting all these things together, uh, just made things slower. That is uh, kind of a non-deterministic nature of these operations and more research is required in order to see what's actually happening. And these kind of things are really uh, requires uh, that you understand the details of the uh, VM internal VM operations, which is again, something that is not uh, uh, desirable to, to have uh, as a final solution for the deep learning programming. So what we want is that uh, VM does what needs to be done for this type of applications without need to dig deep and understand this kind of details. Uh, uh, as a result of this uh, is that for large data sets and big models, it, it is just not possible to achieve comparable performance as with accelerators. And uh, so, it just means that uh, we needed to find a solution to to work with these accelerators from uh, um, JVM. So the options 
for using these ex external accelerators from JVM, uh, what we have explored uh, so far uh, is uh, using JNI, uh, investigating currently using uh, uh, APIs from Project Panama, and uh, also working with uh, Tornado VM. So JNI is a Java native infer interface API that has been uh, around for a very, very long time. And uh, the, the main problem with it, also it works uh, quite well, is that it requires writing and maintaining intermediate layer in C language. Uh, this, this also means that you would have to, every time that the underlying library changes, you would have to uh, change this layer, recompile it. And it also means distributing all the uh, versions for all the different platforms, which makes a deployment uh, very, very, can make your deployment very big in size. And some of of the DeepNet users were just having this specific issue. And the reason why they choose deep, DeepNet is because uh, of its size. Like it's like uh, uh, 60 times smaller than, than the other solutions which ship uh, all these native bindings. Uh, but for those users who don't, don't mind size and just want to get that performance, uh we see one of the potential maybe uh, the optimal solutions uh, or, or let's say easiest to implement and fastest is to use uh, qdnn which are a specialized library for from nvidia for deep learning and the jni bindings for that library is uh, are available from uh, uh, jpook open source jcuda project and uh uh, the project uh, uh, website clearly states that uh, QDNN uh, libraries might change and that, that the, the, the latest version of uh, uh, JCUDA is something like JCUDA 8 and that there are no guarantees that the new stuff is going to work. Uh, so there are potential limitations and problems with that and, and it is not... A, a, Although it is maintained and works well, there are no guarantees for, let's say, commercial users that uh, the, the, the library will continue working with the next releases of uh, um, QDN library. Uh, the next uh, uh, logical thing that uh, is still not available is uh, this uh, foreign memory API and foreign function API from Project Panama. And uh, Project Panama is basically an alternative to J9, and it should solve this uh, main problem with maintaining this uh, uh, intermediate layer and having to write this layer in C. Uh, and it's always the way by automatically extracting this communication layer. At the moment, Project Panama is in preview stage and should be available in Java 20. That should be soon. Uh, and then we will see also that there are some tests and it is already available for, it has been available in incubation phase. And the third way to approach this problem is using a JVM plugin called Tornado VM, which uh, provides very handy, very user-friendly features, developer-friendly, like using stream API to to uh, perform this asynchronous programming. Uh, it performs uh, automatic uh, memory management and uh, automatic optimization and, and what's important execution over of variety uh, devices. So uh, we'll talk about each of them uh, a bit more in detail. So just just uh, uh, overview or at least uh, my view of this uh, landscape and how this uh, approach for using deep learning accelerators from uh, uh, JVM can be achieved. Uh, the interesting thing uh, to note is that uh, this uh, kind of performance and uh, uh, comes from diff for different devices and for different operations. And this uh, number of uh, uh, libraries and devices is really growing uh, very fast. And even from NVIDIA, uh, you, you can see you can find lots of different libraries 
for different uh, purposes. Uh, on this page, you can see th there is section, entire section devoted to mathematical libraries. There is uh, QBLAS, which is basic linear algebra, but it is also QTensor, which are specialized for tensor uh, operations. Uh, there is a, a standard mathematical library, CUDA math library, and uh, there is there are many uh, deep learning libraries. Uh, the one which we have also mentioned is uh, QDNN, which provides uh, this basic deep learning primitives for deep neural networks, but also now there is a tensor RT, uh, and it is uh, providing optimization for runtime and for, for production deployment. So this, uh, as you can see, this uh, landscape uh, solves the problems that people are facing in production, but uh, it is becoming uh, uh, very difficult and more complicated to deal with. And especially when it comes uh, to using uh, these kind of features from uh, uh, virtual machines. But it should be noted that uh, these are available and that when we are building a, a kind of solution for having uh, for the, the deep learning, uh, then this should be definitely included since they make a big difference uh, in production. So uh, as already mentioned, uh, the project Panama uh, seems like a future and it is being uh, announced uh, by Oracle and OpenJDK community as a new great solution for communicating with native libraries that will basically uh, solve uh, this main pain point, uh, which is uh, having to write uh, and, uh, and, and compile and distribute and maintain this layer of C communication with, uh, with it that was required for JNI. Uh, and basically uh, the, the problem uh, with uh, uh, JNI is that uh, uh, you you would have to get uh, not directly calling the, the the methods. You, I guess, uh, most of you are familiar. But if you're not, you basically uh, mark method as native method in your code, and then you uh, write uh, a C C uh, function. That, the, the, in, for that method and that C function talks to uh, native libraries. So that is that intermediate uh, communication layer. Uh, so if you have Java developers in order to be uh, efficient in using JNI, they would also have to become also C developers. So you need C and Java developer, or at least some developers who, know, who write both who are familiar with C and Java, which is not, uh, also not uh, impossible, but uh, not very typical and common to find. And now instead of doing that, because uh, these kind of interfaces were generated from using header files, like C header files, and then uh, based on that, um, this uh, uh, JExtract tool should do that uh, work uh, for you. And it is, uh, at least to my knowing, it is based on using uh, uh, method handles, which are available from uh, uh, Java 7. So for a long time, it is stable. And it is, uh, this uh, project panel will also solve some performance and some security issues that uh, JNI, pro JNI approach had. So basically with project Panama, you won't be calling uh, your bridge that you have right manually, but you will have a pointer to a native function that you can invoke using method handles. Uh, also important part of invoking a method, uh, native methods is uh, uh, passing parameters to those methods uh, and uh, of course taking the, the results. Uh, so all these are uh, being performed using uh, memory segments and uh, this is where foreign memory API comes into the game. And uh, also uh, another pain point with uh, JNI was uh, a conversion of types between C types and uh, uh, Java types. So if you have a string or you have a float or double, 
there were uh, like uh, replacement uh, uh, types in, in defined in JNI, but uh, it is much uh, simplified now with the uh, project panel. Uh, will all that, uh, I would say that project Panama is promising to solve the main points that uh, we are having with JNI at the moment and also uh, excellent performance uh, and replacing some uh, mechanism with the transferring this uh, data. So instead using a, a byte buffer uh, for, uh, for moving data around and uh, uh, preserving uh, uh, the, the multi-threaded multi approach to, to, to the underlying uh, data. So more information about Project Panama can be found on the official uh, Project Panama development page. There's a mailing list also. So the, 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 I, everybody is very uh, interested to see how we all this work in practice. There are some initial experiments being used with uh, uh, TensorFlow to generate TensorFlow, which is one of the most popular libraries uh, for machine learning now. Uh, but uh, all together with the Project of Panama, uh, the promise of it to, to, to enable uh, everything in, in the Java world, I think there are things still missing. So what you will get, you will get a C API written in Java that you can call, and it will not, it will not provide this kind of uh, uh, Java uh, centric programming model and way of thinking uh, to existing Java developers. But hopefully over time, uh, when this becomes available and easily to maintain and scale, uh, uh, it will be, it will be uh, the, the, the entire ecosystem will start to grow. Now, uh, with Tornado VM, uh, it, it takes a, a, a bit different approach. And uh, uh, the idea is to plug, uh, to provide a plugin for the JVM uh, that will uh, automatically allow uh, Java programmers to run on heterogeneous hardware, which is a really great idea. Uh, and, and it's not just the idea, it uh, provides, uh, it can be actually performed now, you can download it and try it from the Tornado. Uh, VM site and it is also supporting some of the very very uh, popular industry APIs like uh, uh, Intel uh, One A API and it can also uh, generate uh, uh, code that can be uh, executed on NVIDIA cards and not just only NVIDIA but also uh, using uh, uh, cards from GPUs from AMD and uh, ARM. So also uh, what makes Tornado different is that it, it also uh, supports FPGAs. And uh, we had some interesting collaboration with Tornado VM team uh, so far. And uh, we are looking in, into the ways to, to, to provide like uh, operations that are related to, to layers and using these devices uh, uh, through VM. And at the, at the same time, uh, having this, uh, uh, feel of the API, which is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, is easy to use and easy to maintain, and developers are Java de developers are used to. So, uh, having uh, said all, all this uh, so far, uh, we looked at the problems, at the requirements, uh, at the problems, at the existing solutions and some experience that uh, we had in building uh, this type of applications. Uh, I would uh, suggest something that uh, could be like an ideal architecture for deep learning on top of virtual machines, at least uh, from uh, our point of view. And we are really grateful for any, any suggestions and add-ons to this architecture. So what we need to have is uh, at the bottom there is accelerator hardware, which is, uh, as we said, highly optimized for this type of operations that we need. That uh, specialized hardware must talk to, to the CPU and to the rest of the, of the computer using its uh, low level uh, API, which is 
we like to can be add on on the uh, device driver. And ideally, uh, a virtual machine uh, should handle that. Uh, that could be a kind of plugin like a Tornado VM uh, is using. And uh, ideally, virtual machine uh, should also handle uh, all the uh, optimization related op operations. And that kind of optimization should be configurable and deterministic, not something that should be uh, should be left to well if it recognizes it it performs if not it, it does not and it does uh, kind of optimizations it thinks it is suitable but something more reliable than the way uh, the, the currently the hotspot is doing also uh, moving memory around from the host device and the accelerator device and the virtual machine that's something that should be completely hidden by the uh from the developer uh tornado is using that approach and also some uh, of rapper uh, classes that we have wrote or uh, hides or all, all that even it is using existing chain solutions based on jni uh, the end developer should not not be aware that these things are happening because it is too low level and it it really uh if you write the code that you, every three th few lines you have to allocate memory and move memory then free memory you lose the the flow of, of the logic of the entire program and the uh, vm should in short it should handle all the communication with this uh, kind of low level apis so maybe uh, having uh, in mind the development uh, of uh, onyx and this uh, open xla maybe uh, it is time to think is it the time for the uh, virtual machine or maybe virtual machine plugin that is specialized for deep learning having uh, in mind also this uh, huge number of applications and interest it, it has at the moment and it will have in the future also it will be even bigger in the future now uh, on top of uh, virtual machines uh, the, the typical deep learning libraries uh, should be like a mid-level APIs for creating uh, layers and building models uh, that will be typically used by data scientists and machine learning engineers. And uh, at the highest level, uh, I think that the standard high-level API that should be used by application developers. So something specific that solves some problem for some application for a specific type of data and specific use. And that should be completely independent from the mid-level APIs. So different machine learning engines should be uh, easily switched and replaced when, when new models become available and new breakthroughs are achieved. So application code doesn't change because uh, that is uh, the choice of uh, engine and uh, choice of hardware and everything else. Uh, it, it is a. It requires a really high high technical expertise to uh, to be uh, to decide on that. So, few uh, notes uh, for the uh, virtual machine and hardware providers is that uh, massive of application of artificial intelligence and machine learning is really changing computing. So it's not just a marketing uh, marketing phrase. Uh, the things are changing. So the CPU uh, time, uh, CPU only time is over. It is not enough in order to run modern applications. The deep learning accelerators is, are really required. And the entire development ecosystem is becoming overly complex and needs to be simplified in order uh, to make it sustainable. So if you share our vision of future of deep learning of virtual machine or have interest for large scale deployment of deep learning in heterogeneous environments, please contact us. And also uh, you're welcome to try uh, DeepNets if you would like just to play with the user-friendly Java deep learning tools. Uh, as I said, it is uh, available for the free download and the development for experimenting. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I, if you have any questions, please.